Who helped you with your timing? Where did you where did you first learn your 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 timing in the booth? Mark Twain. I love not so much his books, mm -hmm. but his speeches. He was just fantastic. Some of the things he said, and the one that I never forget and that I give to every aspiring broadcaster is, I never learned anything when I was talking. Yeah. And if you go in the booth and you remember that, that helps everybody, everybody have a good show. And Clint and I have worked together long enough. Jeff and I worked, you know, long enough. Larry, Daryl, um, Buddy Baker, that with a look, we could tell who was loaded and ready to go and who was almost done with what they were saying. And yeah. I know when I'm talking, I know you guys are locked and loaded and you're just ready to fire away. <laughs> so I need to shorten up these stories so we can get, you know, so we can talk about more things. And, and that's how you learn to do that. So when, when we set the booth up for Fox, um, you remember from Talladega, all right, you're over there. Boyer's here, I'm here. You're looking at this monitor. I'm looking at that monitor so that we can maintain eye contact. Yeah. Because we can say as much to each other with a look as we can with a phrase. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how you develop that timing. Yeah. How long does it take to develop timing with new individuals as they come through the booth? Don't interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> um, with, with most people, you fall into it really pretty quickly. And you will know within one show, you know, pretty much if it's gonna, if it's gonna work or not. I could be getting to the end of the thought and go like this, and, and, and you know, man, you're, you know, you're next. But, but a lot of time, you just you don't have to do that. You have a feel for it. The hardest thing for anybody in radio or TV or podcasting is to sit back and listen. And sometimes with the action, that's the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. Let it unfold. I don't have to tell you every car that's in that wreck as it's happening. I want you to see it and have your own reaction to it. And then we can go back and replays and we can, we can sort all that stuff out. Do you think that, um, like in your own cadence, is that something that you ever paid much attention to or does that come naturally to you? It comes naturally now and it probably has for the last, I don't know, 30 years or so. But yeah, in the, be in the beginning, you do try to develop not so much a rhythm or a cadence, but a means of speaking plainly and helping the listener or viewer understand. So, for example, when uh, we do Barrett Jackson, uh, my buddy Steve Mignante, who's up on the block with me, he is Dr. Date Code. He knows all the casting numbers and production figures and all that, and he can say, you know, they made 1,268 of these cars. I I'm, I'm more broad brush in what we do, and I would go, you know, they made around 1,200 of these mm -hmm. because to the ear, that's much easier to process than an exact number. So, so it's, it's, it's things like that and trying to increase the understanding of the listener or the viewer more so than it is getting the exact thing out there that you'd read in the book or the magazine, Yeah, if that makes sense. What is, your, um, what, is your, what, is the, what is the process that you take to um, bring a moment so, you know, that last lap, right? Car coming off the turn four, whoever it might be, even if it's a single car coming to the finish. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a, a lot of people will realize if you've, if you listen to any of these races, there's a moment where everyone in the booth lays out and the play by play guy is sort of given the baton and it's yep. his to bring it home. And so there may be a race coming up. Or a moment or a milestone coming up. Maybe somebody's about to win their 200th race. Or, or somebody's about to win Daytona for the first time after trying for 20 years. Um, you, have that, you have that knowledge of that moment and that could happen that day, right? Mm -hmm. How do you – do you prepare beforehand? Do uh, you have it – is it just come so naturally – that all of that just pours out of you in that moment? Because I've been so – I admire that. <laughs> I admire – I don't have that ability. And, and I – you know, working with Rick Allen – Yes, you do. But maybe you haven't prepared for it. Yeah. So okay. I want to know how to get so, there. Okay. That's a difference, I think. For me to be a analyst versus a play-by-play -play guy, you deliver the moments. 
And I want to, I'm curious as to how you prepare. All right. Well, let's take the most famous example of that, of course, is the 1998 Daytona 500. Mm -hmm. Going into that race, well, let me back up a year, 97. And your dad's sitting on the grid, you know, and we're getting ready to do the telecast, and I'm in the pits. And he's sitting on the grid. The window net's not up because they know I want to talk to him. And he knows what I'm going to ask, you know. All right, Dale, this is the 19th time. Well, I'm like, you know, you know, can you finally? He knows that's what I'm going to ask because that's the question. Mm -hmm. Can you finally win this thing? Mm -hmm. So I'm facing the camera, and I talk about, for the viewers, your dad struggles to win the 500 and how many times he's come close and how much he's lost it. And then I just walked over to the car, knelt down, and I went, hey, champ, feeling racy today? And that's just, he gave me this big kind of big smile, smirk. And he just gave the best answer in the best interview ever because I didn't ask him what he thought I was going to ask him. Yeah. All right. So now let's go to 98 and CBS has made a change. Ken Squire is now the host. I'm in the booth. I'm calling the race. I had Greg Fielden, our historian, who's written all those great blue books about the history of NASCAR. Uh, yes. And Patrick Perrin, our, Where is he? Uh, our researcher. He's the Greg blue book, Field. The blue book guy. Yeah. Where is he in the moment? Where is he in the moment? In the he's booth. in the booth. Yeah, he's in the booth with us. He's like your stat guy? He's, he is the historian, and Patrick Perrin, uh, who still does the same job yeah. for Fox, is uh, is the stat guy. Oh. He's now the stat guy for Chris Myers yeah. on, on the pre-race set. And during the week, I said, all right, I want to know everything about how many times Dale Earnhardt has come close. I want to know how many laps of this race he's never led. And it was like lap 92, 94 and, of course, 200 were the only laps he'd never led in the race. And so they built this whole thing of what had happened to date. So you'll hear it in, in when you watch the tape. Uh, with 20 laps to go, I'd say, okay, now, you know, 11 times Dale Earnhardt has led this race with 20 laps to go. You know, because <laughs> he was leading. If he yeah. wasn't leading, I wouldn't say it. Right. 10 laps to go. Okay, here's how many times that's happened. Five laps to go. Here's how many times that had happened. I swear – by lap 199, probably even even Daryl wanted him to win. You know, Daryl was in the race. Okay, all right, I'm I'm exaggerating, but uh, so between Greg and 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 Patrick, they had researched this thing eight ways to Sunday. I had read it all, and I'm I'm very lucky that I'm able to retain things for a couple of days. You know, uh, like those old disqualifications. I read that a couple days ago. I don't remember that from 1955, but I read it and I can retain it. Mm -hmm. So I knew pretty much everything they had laid out. And so in the last lap, the emotion takes over. You take everything that you've studied and that you've learned and that you've prepared, but you don't, you don't read it. You let the emotion take over and you be in the moment and you enjoy it and the viewer enjoys it with you as that car comes to the flag, whether it's, you know, Denny winning his 47th race or Earnhardt winning his first 500 or whatever else happens. Yeah. You want to do it in the moment because that's genuine. And that's you. That's fascinating. And people will remember that. It's not easy. No, it's good. It, you want it to look easy, but, hell, it's not easy. No. It takes a lot of prep and it takes a lot of work. Yeah. I'll tell you one more, though. I think that sometimes you, you guys can be your own biggest critic, right? Always. And so, like, you know, the fans reacted, you know, when your first race, when the whole slide job incident, you know, that was you being in the moment in the most truest form possible, right? By definition, in the moment, you're, you're calling it as that happened. And I don't know, I'd love to know your opinion, Mike, but like that, I thought that was a, just a memorable, brilliant moment in racing, and you weren't even trying. Yeah, no, no it, it was perfect because it was not so much the perfect description of what was happening, but it was the element of surprise in your voice that got everybody. That's exactly. what everybody remembers. Right, yeah. right. And that can only come from being genuinely surprised, yeah. you know, as you were. Yeah. That's cool. If you like that conversation with Mike Joy, well, you ought to listen to the entire interview. The Dale Jr. Download is available on all major podcast platforms.